Okay, welcome everyone to the Minnesota Moss or Outdoor Skills and Stewardship Series. Um, my name is Craig Kiger. I'm one of the hosts for the, the Moss Weekly Program. Today is number 98, Burbot Fishing. And uh, if you've never had a chance to catch one of these, they're pretty exciting. We've got our special guest, Carl Peterson and Jody Dirks. So guys, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and then we can jump into Carl's presentation. Sure, I'm, uh, I'll start off. I'm Carl Peterson. I'm a large lake specialist in uh, Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. And my main focus is on Leech Lake up here in uh, the Walker Area Fisheries Office. And I'm Jody Dirks. I'm the Assistant Fisheries Supervisor in the Walker Area. Uh, my responsibilities cover, uh, along with Leech Lake, the northern half of Cass County. Okay. Carl, why don't you go ahead and take it away, and I'm just going to turn my camera off so the folks can focus on you, too. Okay, sounds great. <clears throat> uh, today, Jody and I are going to cover just some basic eel pout basics. Uh, uh, I'm going to start out just giving a brief outline here. Uh, basic biology, I'll cover the basic biology and some research that's been done, uh, things with recent regulations, fishing tips. Jody will cover fishing tips and then uh, cleaning and cooking ideas for them. So. Just a basic, real basic biology of the fish. And I can't remember if they said it or not, but uh, we'll we'll just take questions at the end to try to let things keep flowing. So if you want to have any questions, go ahead and enter them in the chat there. We'll we'll get to those. Burbot, real interesting fish. Uh, also known, they've got a bunch of different names. People call them uh, burbs or eel pout or lawyer ling, freshwater lobster. They got a, a flesh that uh, depends on how you cook it has a tendency to or texture and flavor much like a, a lobster does and there's just you know a lot of lo different local names but it's the only freshwater cod that we have um, and it's also got soft fin rays it's got the single barbel up the front the coloration's real unique and a, a lot of them are different colors like you can see you'll see jody's background that's uh that's a burbot skin color and there's a bunch of different colors that they have you know it's a, just a model brown some have spots along there and they're eel shaped. That's what's real interesting when you fish for them. Sometimes they'll uh, you'll pull them up the hole and they'll actually they'll get that tail flipped over and they'll come up the hole almost backwards on you. Um, there's some smaller ones if when you grab them to fish in that you know I've had it before where they'll, they'll actually wrap around your arm a little bit. It feels like they're trying to grab you back. But real interesting fish. Not not a ton known about them. You know they're they're not researched obviously as much as a walleye or northern pike or or uh, some of you know are more sought after fish, but. As far as distribution goes, they are a, a circumpolar fish. They're found around the globe and uh, mostly in the north latitudes or almost completely and it's above this 40th parallel, you know, around the around the globe there. So if you look at the map, you can kind of see in, it up into northern Minnesota. It's more of a, a deeper water fish. They like the cooler, cooler water. Um, and the, so in Minnesota, the larger lakes, the larger rivers that have some of that cold water refuge. And in Minnesota, there's there's roughly 200 plus lakes that uh, that have eel pout in them that we're, we're finding the eel pout or burbot in there. So just, you know, based on DNR data uh, for the past bunch of years, you looked at the, the lakes and the rivers, these are where they've actually been found in sampling gear. So obviously you can see the large lakes, Lake Superior, Lake of the Woods, uh, the Red Lake chain, uh, Cass Lake chain, I mean, uh, Leech Lake, Mille Lacs, and then, uh, the, you know, Northern, waters into the bigger rivers as well. Life stages for the fish, they start out through the broadcast spawners. So they just, they're on these humps out in the, in the mid lake, they'll, uh, or in the deeper holes in the rivers, they'll, they'll group up and they'll spawn together and they just release the eggs and the eggs spray out and wherever they land, that's where they're gonna stay. And that's where hopefully they're gonna hatch and grow into smaller fish. And those, those larval fish start their life stage out in the middle in open water. And then as they grow bigger, they, they start working their ways into rocky shorelines and finding some, some places where they can hide. So they'll bury down in the rocks and, you know, they can find some small crayfish or small minnows to eat while they're in there. And we see them a lot of times in our, when we're doing our shocking runs along the shorelines where these small fish will come right out of the rocks. And then as they get bigger, they move back out to that deeper water and they can, they can live in some really deep water. And they've, they've, uh, they've done some telemetry stuff on them where they've seen them uh, actually going down, there's a layer of water called the thermocline where in the summertime it sets up. So you've got a lot of oxygen above the thermocline in the summer. There's no oxygen below it, but these burbot, they'll actually go down below that thermocline and they've seen them go down there for periods of time. Then they'll come back up. 
but uh, they've seen them as, as, as deep and documented them as deep as uh, 900 feet in Lake Superior. Um, just to give you a, a warning there, you know, I'm going to show you some examples of some dissected fish in a couple of slides here. So if you're squeamish, just a heads up. But as far as reproduction, they're very prolific spawners. They, uh, they, you can see in this fish here that we opened up, the those, you know, these two big orange sacks over here. Those are those are egg egg masses. There, they have they carry a ton of eggs, and the males have fairly large uh, reproductive organs as well. Spawning is really interesting in these fish. You know, like a walleye or or perch, they're spawning early early ice out after the ice comes out, but. Uh, these, these eel pallets, they'll spawn under the ice. So February to into March, into sometimes even late March, under the ice, obviously, and they'll, they'll come up, they'll usually spend their time in deep water, or it depends on what they're feeding for, what the lake's got for food, but a lot of times in channels and the rivers, and they'll come up on these humps, and like I said, they're broadcast spawners, so they'll group up here, and I'll show you in a second. And uh, <clears throat> they did some um, some study at the Eel Pout Festival a couple of years ago, and they counted actually counted the eggs, and they found anywhere between 120,000 to over a million and a half eggs in one specific one individual fish. But the real interesting thing about the spawn is these spawning balls that they they call these fish will come up and they'll group up together. And uh, I'll show you some video here that uh, that the Bill Linder caught in Linder Media Production. So you can see here, here's a hump. And these fish are grouping up. I'll scoot it just a tear head forward. But real interesting color fish. You can see, you know, here's the hump up here. You can see the deeper water off to the right on the screen. A uh, number of different colors on the fish, some dark ones, some real light ones, some spotted fish in there, some fairly good sized fish as well. So what happens here is there's a, at least one female and sometimes more in the middle of this ball. And when she's sending out some signals that she's ready to spawn, these males will start grouping up around her. And, and they really get to writhing in there. And uh, once she's ready, she'll just release her eggs and the males release their spawn. And uh, the eggs will get fertilized just in the, in the water column and they'll, they'll settle down to the bottom of the lake. And then once that happens, these fish will disperse. So Jody will cover this, the fishing part of it here in a bit, but uh, this is, you know, the, the prime time for fishing for these fish. So, you know, a lot of times they'll come in and they'll be quite voracious feeders and you can catch quite a few fish of an evening and a lot of times you know the angling for these guys is is after dark in the you know the, the dark periods of the night but uh you can see that video there is in the daytime but what's really interesting too is sometimes you know just like any fish here's some video of a, a big jig down there again this is linder media provided this for us so here's a fish coming in you can see the jig down there with a bunch of feet on and the fish obviously can smell it and can hear the action probably and hear it jiggling down there. So swims up to it, takes a look at it, <clears throat> circles back around and he's got that single barrel coming off the front of its chin there, noses it a little bit. And you can, you know, you'll feel this and you'll see this on your graph and feel it on your rod and you, you know, you think you're getting it. And then they just decide they're not hungry that day and they swim away. So Jody will talk about some ways to, to hopefully get those fish to bite if that's what you're getting after. But I'll get back to the PowerPoint and show you some more examples. There we go. <clears throat> so as far as research, like I said, uh, it's very limited information that we have on these fish. We, we you know, occasionally we'll get them in our standard surveys. They, uh, not, not a lot of fish for sure, but uh, the Eel Pout Festival, I'm sure a bunch of us have heard of the Eel Pout Festival in Walker, Minnesota, where it started in the 80s and uh, basically it was an idea of a way just to get uh, folks coming to town and, you know, fish for a fun fish. And they had a tournament for it, but, you know, back then they treated it as a rough fish. So it was a, just a pure tonnage tournament. So they were bringing in whoever could bring in the, the most weight of fish. And they started thinking that, well, maybe we're actually affecting these fish. And the Yopout Festival since then is, is, uh, is, is, hasn't been held since 2019. They had some trouble with people being concerned with garbage on the ice. And uh, and also in 2019, we had a really, really heavy snowy year and the, the festival got flooded out and it was a real trouble getting everything off. So I'm not exactly sure why why they decided to to not hold it since then, but uh, it at least gave us a chance to get a hold of some fish. So we, we collected fish in 2002 and 15 and 16. There's also been you know some limited population work 
and uh, some telemetry stuff where they actually put um, radial tags in these fish and followed where they went and where they spent their, their summers and winters and where they spawned and how they grouped up. And then also some diet evaluation. So here's just an example of, of some of the uh, some of the size ranges for some of the, the fish we collected. 2002, you can see an average length was, you know, around that 19 to 20 inch. And, it, you know, they get up to 32 inches. Ages in 2002 averaged around six, but they seven, eight, 10, 12, 14, 15 year old fish. <clears throat> in 2015, around the same averages. So population hasn't changed a ton, but um, younger fish, we weren't seeing a lot of the older fish, but averaging right around that six years old. I um, should have warned you that this slide was coming, but uh, as far as diets go, um, they're when they're on that pre-spawn activity, they're out there pounding fish and they're uh, they're quite voracious feeders. So you can see here, you know, whatever they find, sometimes we'll see if they find, you know, they get into some mayflies, they'll they'll really eat on, eat on those mayflies emerged for the mud. But, you know, obviously this fish was eating a lot of crayfish and the one over here on the right was eating, found a lot of sucker minnows. So they were eating those and their stomachs are just obviously just jammed full. And for example, this is the, the diet study in 2002 where Yellow perch was the main part of its diet, um, baby rock bass, and then they actually, they're uh, cannibalistic, so they're eating eating some some of their own, And uh, but it's a, you know, a fairly varied diet to a lot of little minnows and then yellow perch. And it depends on the lake. So, you know, if, if lake have, the lake has a lot of crayfish, you might get a lot more um, focusing on those crayfish. So it depends on, you know, if you're gonna go out fish for them, try to find out what the lake has in it. And so how are you gonna fish for them and where are you gonna fish for them? Uh, as far as regulation goes, before, prior to 2020, like I said, they were simply considered a rough fish, so there was no limits, and uh, but unfortunately, we saw a lot of waste from People just thought they were a garbage fish, so we'd see them just thrown up on the ice. Um, in 2020, that they became listed as a game fish, so they're still in the process of developing and determining what the, what the best regulation for those fish will be. So uh, right now, there's no harvest limits, but there is a proposed bag that they're working on uh, getting through the rulemaking process. And, and you'll see more about that in, in future months and in the next year of uh, how you provide personal comments on that and what's your opinions, what you think the, the limits should be. So like I said, that's a work in progress. And that's all I've got for my section. We'll let uh, Jody take over and talk about how to fish for them. All right, so Benji, are my slides showing? Hey, yep, hit your presenter mode though. How do you want me to stop that? No, they're showing. You just hit the slideshow, so we see the actual the whole slide. Oh, okay, okay. All right, so um, as Carl said. Uh, I'm going to cover some of the the angling techniques that go along with with fishing for burbot. Um, just to start out with, um, you know, I want to talk about how how lucky we are as Minnesotans to be in an area where we have uh, pretty robust burbot populations. Um, although they you know they occur at different uh, more southern latitudes, uh, really central Minnesota seems to be uh, an area where um, where we have uh, multiple opportunities, streams, rivers to to be able to target these these fish. Um, so, bad 2020, as Carl said, um, gained game fish status. Um, a lot of times these fish are um, targeted uh, near Jody, lines. Yes, do you want to you want to try to share yours again? We, for yeah. some reason, it lot it popped you out there. Sorry about that. All right. <clears throat> and when you want to switch a slide, it shut the PowerPoint down for some reason. 
Do you have it now? There you go. Yep, hit the slideshow mode and you should be good to go again. All right, thanks, Benji. After Jody's done, if everybody just uh, lower right-hand corner in the ellipsis there, I'm gonna open some polling questions as soon as Jody's done with his presentation too, so. Uh, but permit are usually targeted um, anywhere from 15 to plus 50 feet deep. Um, usually along steep brake lines uh, with with deep water access, as you can see here, this is an example of of a, a pretty typical burbot uh, type spot, uh, 15 feet on top of a hump. Uh, ultimately, a pretty quick slide transition down into about 60 feet of water. Um, as far as gear goes, uh, burbot gear can be as simple or as advanced as as the angler wants it to be. Most walleye gear is sufficient for uh, targeting burbot. Uh, I personally like to use like a 28 inch uh, medium rod um, and a, like a, a larger, a larger spooled reel, like a 1000 or, or even bigger size reel. Um, uh, the baits that you see there are like one ounce uh, jigs or spoons. I like to use a fluorocarbon line, usually something in the eight pound range, uh, something that can handle a large fish yet doesn't uh, doesn't cause any icing issues um, like braid would. I also like to put a swivel on just to, to minimize line twist. Um, and the baits more specifically, uh, the best thing you can have is something that glows, especially when you're fishing at night for these fish. Um, visual acuity doesn't seem to necessarily be one of their strong suits. So something that glows is is um, is very important. Uh, I like to at this point tip these with uh, with fathead minnows or or suckers or or any fish matter for that that matter. Um, when it comes to harvesting vervet, um, practice selective harvest. Um, as we said, they're currently a game fish in Minnesota, and uh, as you saw in the video that Carl showed, uh, very vulnerable during the spawn. Um, a lot of times that's where they are actually targeted um, at different times of the year, and and you can catch a number of them. So please limit the, the size and number uh, that you harvest. Um, avoid fishing too deep. Uh, fish caught below 30 feet um, tend to, if they're released, tend to run the risk of delayed mortality due to the effects of barotrauma, which is essentially just the pressure difference from that deep of water being brought up to the top. Um, and then practice handling good techniques if you're going to release those fish. Uh, treat it like a walleye or any other game fish species. You know, Avoid freezing the eyes, the fins, the gills, having them out of the water uh, too long. Um, this is something we used to see you know, years ago, and, and, and fortunately it's, it's seeming to, to decline in, in in occurrence, but this is something that uh, that now that they're a game fish, you know, we, we see less of, but please don't waste these fish. They're a pretty special fish and and we're, we're fortunate to have them. Um, if you're going to clean burbot, um, videos are available on the Internet. Uh, the mediator burbot cleaning video is one that uh, I viewed and, and seemed to um, show a pretty good example of how to clean these fish. Um, a couple of different ways include skinning uh, using a set of pliers. Uh, such as a, like using a, or as if you were cleaning a catfish, uh, fillet or skin similar to walleyes as well. And then again, utilize utilize all the edible meat that you have, um, and eat these fish fresh. The palatability of of burbot flesh seems to uh, decrease after freezing, so just keep enough for a meal. Um, here's an example of some fish that we found on the ice that were cleaned really uh, inappropriately. Um, so the tail meat section portion there was left on the carcass as well as this. This rib meat, and that's all good edible meat, and, and unfortunately, most of or half of that fish was was left to waste. Cooking burbot. Um, so internet searches there again. Anything that's uh, that's good for for cod is good for burbot. Um, uh, deep fried. I, I know one of the more popular popular recipes is the freshwater lobster. Um, boil in seven up or salt water, and then dip in melted butter. And then lastly, um, if you don't intend to 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 harvest these fish, um, practice catch and release. Uh, currently, without a, a a set bag limit or harvest limit, uh, anglers are are on their own to limit what they uh, to be responsible and limit what they're going to harvest. Um, there again, keep a meal. Don't uh, don't fill an otter sled full of these things and take them home and freeze them for another day. Um, just uh, just practice good good harvest. Uh, catch and release tactics. That's all I've got. Okay, nice job, guys. Um, we're waiting for a few questions to come in. I have one burbot story. Uh, we were fishing crappies. 
up on uh, Lake Bowstring and my bobber went down and I had a good bite on the other end of the line and I brought this fish up and after talking or Carl telling the story about coming up backwards, I think this one did. And as I reached down into the water to grab that fish, it wrapped its tail around my arm and it's like, holy cow, what is this thing, you know? Never seen one before. And I had a good buddy fishing with me and he said, oh, that's an eel pot. He said, they're good to eat. And I said, really? He said, yeah, we'll have you over. He said, you know, you boil them and dip them in butter. And he said, it's fantastic. So I let him take the fish home and Oh, a couple of weeks later, I said, when are we going get, to get together and have that fish? Oh, he said, we ate it already. So I never got to try it, <laughs> catch one. But um, our first question is in here from, from Jeff. Hey, Craig, can I interrupt you real quick? Sure. just want to remind everybody that we did open the poll, the polling questions. So while you're thinking about questions to answer, if you want to look at the poll, the bottom right hand of your screen is those three little ellipses. You can open up the poll there and please answer our questions. We'd appreciate it. Okay, so Jeff was wondering, how would you target burbot in a river? Are they known for being a river fish? Joe, do you want that one? Sure. Um, so yeah, they're definitely in, in some of the larger rivers, um, the Mississippi, St. Croix, Mississippi River, uh, even as far south as like Lake Pepin, they've been they've been caught um, targeting them. Uh, I have never done it personally in rivers, um, but I have to imagine it's, it's very similar to to lake areas. Um, probably most, you know, most of it's going to happen during the spawn and and along steep break lines if you can find something along the river channel. Um, I don't have any personal experience with with fishing them in rivers. You know, one thing, especially on rivers, it depends on if they have impoundment impoundments on at all. Or, you know, you got some smaller streams that might have some cooler water coming in. Since they are a cool water species, that you can definitely, you know, like some of these larger dams will, or smaller dams, even will be taking water off the bottom of the, the, the reservoir above it. So those cool water outlets are, are a good spot to, to look for burbot. So uh, if, they're, if they're piling up in there looking for, looking for a little bit cooler water for sure. The one thing I'd recommend too, you know, is, uh, is use your resources out there. So, you know, if, if you're looking to go to a specific area, the local bait shops are generally a huge wealth of knowledge for sure. So get a hold of those local bait shops and and don't forget to call your local fisheries offices as well, because you know the the area fisheries office will have a good idea what you know what lakes and rivers in that specific area. You know, like if you're focusing on Lake of the Woods, where you know they might be able to. To give you a, a place to go where or, uh, where they're finding them. So okay, so folks, remember to use that Q and A function. We've got quite a few in the chat here. Um, let's see. Is the liver good to eat? I hear some folks say yes. Yeah. There was actually, a, there was a commercial market for them uh, in Lake of the Woods years ago, um, targeting them for, for their liver, um, for the fish oil in them, because it's very similar to cod oil. Yeah, it's high in vitamin contents for sure. So it, it, uh, they're definitely good to eat. I don't know how to prepare them, but, uh, you know, I suppose you could eat it maybe like a, like a pate or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nate would like to know what bait presentation works best, aggressive jigging or more slow and methodical? Uh, it depends on the day. Um, there again, um, if they're spawning or not, uh, at night, aggressive jigging, pound it on the bottom, um, try to make a large disturbance. Um, during the day, it seems like uh, they're either going to bite or they won't, um, but even sometimes they're a little bit smaller lures, you know, walleye type jigs, if they're, if they're spawning during the day, will be more effective. Okay, and that kind of leads into Tom's question. Is it possible to catch them during the day? Yeah, it is possible. Um, it seems like it's always correlated with their spawning. Um, as you saw in the one video that Carl presented there, uh, that was actually occurring during the day. Uh, and, it, and it happens throughout the day. Um, 
kind of move on and off throughout it. You know, it seems like there'll be fish there for a little while and then they move off and a couple hours later, fish will move back on and, and move back off. So just got to got to be there. Steve, Steve had a question comment for you guys. It says they spawn in late February to middle of March. So why don't we close the season during that time? And he's seen four guys catch 50 to 100 fish in a night. At this point, there is, you know, there is no regulation for them. Um, like Carl mentioned, there's something probably potentially coming down now that they're game fish species, um, whether it be, it's most likely a bag limit. Um, closing, season closures, I don't think at this point have been discussed. Um, but, it, it, and there again, it, it's a good opportunity to get out and catch some fish. Um, so you hate to close a season in that nature. Um, and plus fish, you know, at that point they spawn at different times of the year, similar to some other fish, you know, they may, the Lake of the Woods may spawn at a different time than, than fish more south. So at that point, you know, a season closure would be ineffective probably. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the one thing where the, you know, the comment period where you see these comment periods come out for regulations, we absolutely do take those into account and look into that. So, you know, if the vast majority of people that commented said, yeah, we would prefer a catch and release season during then uh, during the spawn season, then we would, you know, look at that and evaluate if that made biological sense as well. So mm -hmm. like I said, I would encourage you once the comment period opens to, to provide that those comments and your opinions on that. So it looks like uh, Tom took my suggestion and he put it over in the Q and A too, about, you know, catching during the day or uh, strictly at night and answered that. So Benji, you can go ahead and, change that one out if you would please and then uh, chad wanted to know how far south in minnesota is their range and where is the population big enough to target them <clears throat> you know, I, was, oh, I was i was going to try to pull that map up so if you want to i know they have been caught in lake pepin uh, they sample them there I believe two DNR does. Okay, that's pretty far south. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fairly far south. So, <clears throat> but that's where the the local fisheries office would be the best resource to talk to. So you know we're in northern Minnesota, so we don't I don't hear quite as much about you know the, the lakes a little bit farther south than us. But and then even in our area, we've got you know different shapes of lake. We got some lakes that are twenty feet deep and warm, and they're not a pout in them. And, you know, we've got the deepest lake in the state in our area too that has pout in it. So, <clears throat> so we're going to switch back over to chat because a few people have went back over there. Uh, Jeff wants to know what about what about burbot makes them so hard to catch in the summertime? Is it the the depths that they live in, the cooler water? Is that what they're looking for? Yeah, we just don't know what their activity level is really during the summertime. Um, if it's, you know, there have been some studies on, on some telemetry stuff that shows they do move, um, but targeting them is generally difficult just because of the, the habitats that they're inhabiting. Carl talked about where they'll actually dip below the thermocline to find that, that cooler water. Um, so I think their activity level is probably just such that they don't lend themselves well to angling. Mm -hmm. I mean, they still got to feed, so they probably come up into the shallower waters to feed and then back to that back to that cooler oh, water yeah. yeah and some of that telemetry stuff has showed that as well you know as well they've shown them you know where they'll get up as shallow as two three feet of water and they'll be up there you know there's a lot of small things like crayfish and fish up in shallow so mm -hmm. night they'll come up in the shallows and they'll feed and they'll just go back out in the deep water during the day especially to get away from that you know sunlight penetrating deep and find some cooler water so but yeah, they're definitely, I, I just don't think they're as active at all. And we see the same thing when it's not the spawn season. You know, a lot of times up here, if uh, a lot of anglers, if they're going to focus on them and it's early winter, they'll they'll go out. It's a, it's a very time, very much a night bite where it's an after dark. You know, it's not like that, that prime time walleye bite where it's right at dusk that, you know, it's mm -hmm. go to work after work, get a good dinner in and wait for it to get good and dark and then go out and you, you'll catch them you know, later in the evening, later, later at night, for sure. And then as you get closer to that spawn, that's when they start to get more active during the daylight hours. So this question is, uh, we live in Southwest Minnesota. How can we find burbot waters down here? 
talk to their local fisheries office maybe see if there's anything that that those guys have on sample nets that would show yeah i'm not aware of any any waters down in southwest minnesota i did a just a you know our, our went to our and through our database from 2000 and i didn't find any lakes in southern minnesota like southwest minnesota that had burbot so everything mm -hmm. there's for the most part too shallow and too warm yep and anton any burbot in the twin cities i think lake pepin that's twin cities isn't it yeah lake pepin so that'd probably be one of the best bets and you know Malax is not too far away from the twin cities it's not exactly the cities but Okay. So while you guys are thinking up your next question, uh, Benji, you want to talk about the poll results? It looks like the poll has ended. Yeah, we can do that. So of the people that answered the poll, thank you, everybody that did that. Have you ever caught a burbot? 45% uh, of the respondents have caught one. Uh, if you have fish for burbot do you catch and release or keep it need it 38 percent they catch and release only 16 percent are keep it eat it and what do you think a good limit of burbot would be oh i lost my so we had only three percent thought one 49 percent of respondents thought two to four would be a great limit 14 percent thought five to six and Nobody thought six or more would be good. Interesting. That's all we had for poll questions. Thank you everybody for joining us on those. Those are just kind of fun little questions. You know, Jody, you mentioned the St. Croix River for burbot fishing. I live fairly close to that river. You got any tips for uh, finding them on the St. Croix? I don't. Um, so like I said, I just, I have no personal experience with, with fishing them on rivers. <laughs> Um, you know, like Carl maybe mentioned, find find some kind of confluence with a, a cold water stream. They might be, you know, hanging out near the confluence of that. But um, they're definitely there's definitely burbot habitat in the Saint Croix. So. so, Joey, you had talked about the spoons and the the jigs, fairly heavy, go in the dark. But which one's your go to bait to start out an evening? Um. I generally start with the spoon. Um, I I don't know that uh, I don't know that the the jig is any better than the spoon. Um, it just it seems to be a um, the difference seems to come in whether it's a, a day bite or a, or a nighttime bite for me. Whether I use mm -hmm. a larger profile bait or a smaller profile bait. So, like fishing walleyes up on Lake of the Woods, we use the the spoons with a uh, just a minnow head. Would you put the whole minnow on then? Yeah, sometimes multiple minnows. Really? Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Give give them give them an offering. Put a put a different species of minnow on each, yeah. each hook. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and what do you find is your your favorite minnow? I mean, suckers I, are going to be tough. Yeah, I just know, always they'll last a long time. Use use fathead minnows. Um, you can you can load them up on a hook and and they they stay on. There there's different products you can buy. Bait buttons they're called that like a rubber band you can slip over the the hook point uh, to keep baits mm -hmm. on longer. But um, the big thing is just keep it in the water and keep keep pounding the bottom. And go every about twenty minutes I'll reel it up and check to make sure I still have bait. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But. <clears throat> this is where those things were you know like. You can definitely fish them, you know, as simple as you want. Just take a big jig and a, you know, big glove of whatever you have down there and throw it down there and bang the bottom. But if you do have some of these electronics, especially an underwater camera, that that's where these come in real handy. So you can actually see those fish because you'll be, you know, they'll be bumping your bait like that video I showed, and you'll be thinking you're getting strikes there, especially when you get that bait ball, you know, and they're all just swarming around your bait. You just don't know what a strike is and what's not a strike. But with an underwater camera. You can actually see that take and then you can set the hook from there. So that's a, a real good tool for, for fishing these fish on those on those humps because they'll come in and just smell your bait and sometimes they swim away. The the videos that you showed that the the fish ball, um, they all seem to be pretty nice size fish. Is there a size discrepancy between the males and females like in other fish species, or do they all 
tend to be pretty good sized fish. <clears throat> they tend to be pretty good sized fish. We, you know, we haven't noticed that it's not like, you know, like with some fish, you like with walleyes, when, when we catch a walleye in the spring, when we're doing our spawn take, you can tell for the most part which ones are females, which ones are males, just by looking at the exterior of them. Mm -hmm. The eel pout, the both gonads are so big and the fish are, look fairly similar that it's, it's really almost impossible to tell, you know, wow. males from females. And when, especially when we were opening them, a lot of them up at that eel pout festival, we'd see that same thing. Like we were, you know, trying to guess and you just couldn't really guess. So I, I see a question just popped up here. Any suggestions for lakes around Grand Rapids? Um, you know, the, the one that I, one and only one I caught was on Bowstring, and that's not too awfully bad drive from Grand Rapids to get up there. Um, <clears throat> I have no idea if they've got them in other lakes around here or not. I just never, never seen them out there. Yeah, for sure, they, Bowstring and Winnie. Yep. Yeah. Um, and there was a question from Ryan here. We use cut bait minnows and pretty well on the St. Louis River. Not sure if that would work elsewhere, though. Yeah, I know, like Lake of the Woods, they'll they'll do that for sure. So, mm -hmm. and since they feed on crayfish, you know, if you can get a crayfish, you can't transfer crayfish bait. You know, it's not mm -hmm. like you can take crayfish, especially rusty crayfish, from one lake to the next, but. But, uh, you know, I always thought that a crayfish tail would work fairly well. You know, it's a nice chunk of shrimp, basically, on, on their mm -hmm. hook. You know, they're feeding on that stuff. I yeah. didn't see that, too, where they just, you know, like, take some of those saltwater salt water lure baits that they have, just like a, an almost like a stink bait, and uh, just put it on a, on a bare jig just to get some sort of scent on there, and you can really pound it. And that way you don't have to worry about the bait coming off as much. So and mm -hmm. I know some anglers have had some sex, success with that. Ryan said that sounds something like catfishing. Yeah, kind of. A lot of it's, you know, it's a reaction bite that you're getting out of there, just pounding the bottom, just pulling them in for sure. So if a guy could get a hold of night crawlers, would a ball of night crawlers work for bourbon? I guess I've never used night crawlers, but I don't know why it wouldn't. Why it wouldn't work, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. The, the one thing though is they're not, you know, they're not necessarily feeding on night crawlers much that time of year. Right. But if you find them on those mud flats and they're, you know, picking some mayfly larvae out there, that might be might be something. But. Mm -hmm. Craig, I see Nate entered one in the chat. That's an interesting question. If you were going to practice selective harvesting, is there a size that is best to keep that offers a fair amount of meat while ensuring that the best reproducers are released? um yeah i guess uh it's it's difficult like carl said to distinguish like males from females um but anytime you start talking about big fish there's a there's a good chance it's probably an older um an older fish which even at that point it, it's got a chance of being a larger female um i guess if i had to recommend a size you know something in that maybe three or four pound range um maybe 22 23 inches at the most something like that um I don't harvest a lot of burbot, so as far as that's concerned, I'm not sure that there's a a yield that you know what, what size you know pr produces the most yield in meat. But um, definitely, I would release some of the you know the bigger fish. You know, I wouldn't be keeping six plus pound fish. Mm -hmm. Got a got a few more here in the chat. Um, Troy was offering some wisdom. He said he finds juvenile fish in the cool water tributaries during the summer. But have not caught an adult while fishing, and that's for the St. Croix River. So, cooler water, and I don't know what size those juveniles would be if they're something that you would want to take home, or if they're basically just a, a larger fry stage or something like that. If you're fishing for walleyes and putting the head of the minnow on the bait, and put put the tail and use the heads back down the hole. When reading your electronics, you'll see them eating the heads and tails many times before you before they eat your offering. So, um, so you're like chumming for them. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see here. This one says that that's the catfish parallel selective harvest, and Troy said three to five inches for the 
juveniles. So that's not a very big burbot. Um, <clears throat> so we've got a few more minutes here. If you guys can think of any other questions you'd like to, to run by our experts today. And, um, you know, that uh, time on the ice, February, late March, I mean, it's just um, a nice time to be out there. You know, the, the sun's reflecting off and I've had days where you can actually go out and fish in a lighter shirt. You don't need your big parka and the the, the sun shining on that melting snow. You get a get a sunburn from from the reflection. So it's just a good time to be out. The kids were playing building uh, snow castles with uh, five gallon buckets because we weren't putting fish in them. So they were making snow castles. But it doesn't look like we got any more questions that have come in. So I think we're gonna, well, when, oh, question from uh, Ron wants to know, what are their predators besides man? That's basically it. Well, when they're younger, for sure, because they're, you know, pretty tasty little morsels, but they're pretty small. And so anything will gobble them up if they get a chance, for sure. Pike, especially, you know, the smaller ones up in the shallows. But okay. uh, as far as once they get out, you know, once they get big enough, there's not a lot that can eat them, for sure. But Yeah. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. I, I learned a lot about the the fish and the fishery that we have for them here in Minnesota. And, you know, talk to your local bait shops. They're going to have tidbits of information on what might be happening locally to you. Um, and get out there and give this a try. I mean, winter can be long in Minnesota, and this is a chance to get out and be part of the outdoors. So thank you, everybody. Benji will have you go ahead and stop the recording and tune in next week for episode 99 bald eagles in minnesota <laughs>